Okay, good morning. It's so nice to see all of you and also get to know you a little bit and talk about the fun facts that we have. So um, I'm going to try and talk for 15, 20 minutes, but if you want to stop me to clarify anything, let me know. Um, um, so that, you know, but I think we have some time for you to ask questions or make comments and just go from there and try and keep it informal at that point. But I want to just go through some really quick things about India. So um, uh, basically what I'm going to try to do is give you a kind of an overview and hopefully very quickly of how India got to be the way it is right now. So given some key things in Indian history and culture. And then I'll also show some pictures so you don't fall asleep because there's a lot of facts. But I've tried to sort of summarize those facts. Um, uh, and then I'll you know, give some historical and then some contemporary and with some contemporary snapshots. So, one of the things that uh, I think is very uh, interesting about India, when you go there, uh, uh, it might seem familiar at times, but then suddenly it's not familiar at all. So it's very, very hard to generalize. And I often start with an example of McDonald's, because everybody knows McDonald's, right? And when you go to India, you'll see a McDonald's. But if you go into McDonald's, you will see the Maharaja Mac. It's not Big Mac, but there's Maharaja Mac. And it's chicken patties, two chicken patties in a bun, because they don't do beef in India, right? <coughs> and you'll see Makalu Tikki burger. And Makalu Tikki, well, back, you know, alu is actually potato in Hindi. So it's a potato burger. So talk about carbo loading. <laughs> but people like that. And there'll be Makimoli sauce, and there's something um, <coughs> that I call Mac, Mac veggie burger, uh, Mac spicy paneer burger. Mac spicy paneer burger? You all know what paneer is? That's a homemade Indian powdered cheese. So they have a paneer burger, but it's Mac spicy. <laughs> okay, Mac spicy paneer burger. So anyway, that just gives you a little thing that, you know, what seems to be, you know, uh, familiar is suddenly not familiar at all. were interesting. Um, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith was an economist from Harvard, but he also was a um, uh, U.S. ambassador to India under John F. Kennedy in the early 60s. And he just developed a lifelong love of India, he and his wife Kitty. And he called India a functioning anarchy. That's the best quote that I can give you for what India is like. It's at some level it functions, but it's chaotic. So be prepared for it when you're there. And Gita Mehta, I, I like this one. It, she said, at its best, Indian culture is like a massive sponge, absorbing everything while purists shake their heads in despair. But India has always shown an appetite for foreign devils, matched by, only by her capacity to make them go native. And when you talk about India's history, you kind of see some of that, how India got to be the way it is now. Okay? And of course, no new planet you are known, love it or hate it. You can never ignore India. And I think you're finding that out here in the US, right? It's a big country. So, so that's one uh, uh, interesting thing about India. Uh, this uh, gives you a little bit of the diversity of India. I don't want you to, you don't need to remember everything, but I think some things are very interesting. It has 1.3 billion people very, very huge, uh, going to overtake China soon, but it's four times the size of the population of the U.S., but on a land area that's one third the size. You know, so that gives you a comparative perspective of how compacted it is. In terms of population diversity, there are people like the Vidians who went down to the south, and then the Indo-Aryans are sort of the northern two-thirds of India. And those are the people that came from the Caucasus mountains, the Caucasians, the ones who came towards the east, um, and about 3% indigenous peoples. 200 languages, officially 22. 
in the language was 20 others. And 33 languages spoken by more than a million people. So again, another fact about diversity. Then the religious diversity, that's what people most notice in India. Um, uh, and uh, so it's history very tied to you know, its religious uh, life. 80% uh, Hindus, 40% Muslims. Uh, but 40% Muslims are like 300 million or 200 million people, something like that, but a lot of people. 2% um, Christian Sikhs and Buddhist Jains, Jews, others, right? Um, and I just want to make sure you understand that not all, everyone practicing the same religion is the same, right? It's just like in the U.S. And the other thing that's really important is that high rate of economic growth, and you'll probably hear about organization and innovation later, but two-thirds of the people still live in rural areas, so there's a real disparity and divide, but there's also a lot of development. It creates a lot of unevenness there. Here's a map, just so I think you get the uh, textbook, but I thought this was good because I'm sorry, north-south, but I think if you look at you know the Pakistan area, which used to be part of British India, that's where a lot of foreigners came to India. And then um, if you go to the four um, uh, southern, States here, um, down here, that's where most of what we know as Dravidian origin people live. And those are four different main languages in that area. So that's, um, and the rest are on top. I think you all are going to be in Bangalore. Yeah. Right, right here. And then you're going to fly to Delhi, and then Accra is right there. This is just to give you a so if I say north, south, east, west, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right. And at any point, you want to ask a question or two, please go ahead. Oh, these are some pictures I'm going to show you. And this is in Delhi. But uh, you can see at the back is actually a metro station. And then this is a mall in front and a plaza. So very modern urban India. And this is a street in what's New Delhi, in the Tins, India. And this is a street in Old Delhi. I don't know if you get to go there, but that's you know crowded, you know, smaller streets. And the walled city of Delhi. With awesome electrical wiring. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. yeah you see Cell that. phones, but kind of scary electrical wiring. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever go to Old Delhi? Yeah. Yeah. And this is Bangalore traffic. Uh, and you'll find Bangalore actually has worse traffic jams than Delhi does. So you'll get plenty of traffic jams when you're there. Okay, I have to be careful what I do here. Do you want me to do your slides? No. Okay, no, I'm fine. And if you go to the smaller towns, but even in the, uh, in the main towns, you'll find a lot of people selling vegetables in carts like that. So that's something you see all over. And that's in the village we went to, um, a woman just sitting outside her house. This was a suburban village outside of Delhi. And it's a little store in the village. Uh, and one of these women was actually the person who owned the store, so she's selling stuff. Uh, I saw you might be going to a Gurdwara, and this is a Gurdwara Sikh temple, and this is in Old Delhi, Siskand. You go to Banglasa, which is my favorite. <laughs> it's very, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, this is a mosque in the Zamadine in Delhi also. Are you going to? We're going to try. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that was at Ramadan actually when I was there. This is a Hindu temple in the south. Uh, I think it's Chennai. Uh, and here's a little boy who's going to be getting her thread ceremony done. Uh, little brown boys, uh, you know, have to go through this. So it was outside that time. And here's the church in Chennai, which is uh, where the relics of St. Thomas the Apostle are buried. So it's got an old Christian history too in India. So if you have a sense of the religious diversity with some school kids. And there's some college students. If there's anyone you'd see anywhere. Uh, and this is Wipro, which is actually outside of Bangalore, uh, the, one of the high-tech you know, software companies in India. And there's cricket on the beach. You have crickets everywhere. You will see people playing all over the place. And there's uh, and right nearby is it's a fishing village. So there's a fishing um, in the south. It's a very big problem playing. 
There's some food. This is a vegetarian dish. In the south, you get more of this, I think, than in the north. And this actually, we'll go there, but this is a group of faculty that I had taken three years ago to India as part of a seminar that we had. So I thought that would be a nice way to get to some pictures. Any impressions, thoughts, quickly, before I move on to the nitty gritties of Indian history and culture? Yeah, uh, we gonna be on the coast at any point? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Because you're not even going to Mumbai, right? No. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going with you, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, yeah, we contemplated, but um, but we got short enough time. To yeah, yeah. Um, if you, uh, yeah, but you, uh, you know, hopefully this will inspire you to go again. India is not very. Once if you make a proper arrangement, you can go by yourself. You can be a nice tourist in India. There's a plenty of infrastructure, so don't, don't get scared by. I mean, you'll be only around by crowds. I think. Any other thoughts? So anyway, let me just get on to the next one. Because the data, if you have any questions, I, I think I'm just going to do the wrong. That's what I'm pushing. There you go. Um, this is, you know, um, just gives you a little older ancient history of India, and um, this is from about. 4,500 years ago, when it was a village culture, and then the Indus Valley Civilization of Harappan culture, which a lot of people know, because a lot of the world history texts will talk about the Indus Valley Civilization, and then they stopped there as the India stopped moving after that, you know? But that was 4,000 years ago. <laughs> so okay, things have changed since then. But I think what's important is that that's when the earliest evidence of Shiva, who then later became uh, uh, one of the main primary gods in Hinduism. His first images emerged at that time. And also at that time, uh, the three main social categories of people, the aristocrats, the priests, and then the common people, that became the basis of what later became the caste system in India. So I think that's important. And that's uh, uh, about 3,500 years ago is when the Central Asians started coming, uh, speaking the Indo-European languages, Aryans. There's some dispute now what to call them, but this is what we have. And that's when the hymns of the Rig Veda, which are the Hindu hymns that were written, and became the uh, basis of Brahmanism and Hinduism as interpreted by the elites. The Brahmins were the elites, and they are the ones who, that's a, this, is the, this is what Hinduism is all about. Uh, Sanskrit, the language Sanskrit was introduced, and Sanskrit is the basis of all the like, North Indian languages. Yeah, it's an Indo-European language, and they're all rooted in Sanskrit. The South Indian languages are the Dravidian languages, and the Brahmanic texts. Uh, and then you can see the caste system that came into being, just so you have a little sense of how that happened. Uh, then we come way down to the 6th century BC, and that's when Buddhism and Jainism were introduced. And it's sort of surprising that Buddhism and Jainism both emerged in India, but Buddhism then became much more popular in China, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, <coughs> Japan. And uh, only less than 2%, less than 1% actually of Indians are Buddhists now. Okay. <coughs> so that's when it was introduced. Um, and both Buddhism and Jainism actually came as a challenge to this uh, developing hierarchy and Brahmanic Hinduism. Okay, so, uh, so it just gives you a little sense of the diversity. Then uh, you don't have to understand all that stuff, but the next thousand years, there were periods of stability, such as during the Mauryan Empire and then the Gupta period, but there was also a lot of political fragmentation in India. I think that's important. So that's a thousand year period. I'm going to just club it all together, but it, it really had a lot of stuff happening. Uh, so even as Brahmanic Hinduism became more organized, uh, also popular cults also emerged, and Buddhism and Jainism also spread. And I want to say a little bit about bhakti. I've highlighted it over there. Um, uh, bhakti is a devotional form of Hinduism. Um, and it's where uh, people can uh, sort of attain spirituality and salvation and through a direct connection with God. You don't need a priest as an intermediary to interpret the texts. So you can not have to read the, not be able to read the text, which is a vast majority of people in India at that time. 
could not read or write, so for them, they just started praying on their own and doing their own ritual. But one of the main things was this through meditation, spirituality, so it has some Buddhist elements in it, but it's also the yogic elements, you know, all of that you see, so that's bhakti. Bhakti is basically meditation, that's what it means, you know, so through your own personal meditation. So it really appealed a lot to people who were disadvantaged, the marginalized people, and women. So some of the most famous poets in this tradition are female poets. Mira is a famous bhakti poet. So these are women who wrote, and some of the Buddhist nuns also. Are so. so that's an important part of the diversity of Indian religion and Hinduism that I think is important. Um, but the Hinduism spread, to, uh, okay. But I think the main thing, again, you can see all the different kinds of kingdoms that were there at different times. You don't have to know all of this, and I don't. <laughs> so, but it just gives you a sense of the variety and diversity of India. Okay, I still sent the wrong one. Okay. Then um, about 8th century to the 16th century is when the Islamic influence came to, oh, you know, my, the top of the slide is not showing up there, but that's okay. Um, I'm not sure why. Things down at the bottom. Yeah, it's kind of down at the bottom. I'm not sure if that's very so anyway, it doesn't matter. This slide says Islamic info, but the text is there, so that's really what is really important, okay? Um, uh, so that's the 800-year period before the British and the Europeans came. Um, uh, so there's Qutub, the Delhi Sultanate was formed, and um, Muslim Hindu coexistence. Uh, Sufism came, and Sufism is uh, a part of Islam. And it's sort of like Bhakti Hinduism, Sufi Islam is also a devotional thing. That's uh, very popular in Turkey, for example, northern India and other places. So a lot of Muslims in India are Sufis. And so it's a much more of a pacifist kind of Islam. And it's also a devotional. Again, you don't need priests. And you can just do your own singing and music and uh, meditation and poetry through which you have a direct connection to God. Okay, so it's like Bhakti Hinduism and Sufi Islam. It's just that they have different ones: Allah and ones whoever, <laughs> Shiva or Krishna or any you know in Hindu Bhakti. So what happens is that in the 15th century, uh, Kabir, who was a major Sufi poet, <coughs> who was also a Hindu, um, sort of a Bhakti people a person, he developed what came to be known as Sikhism. That's a Sikh religion. That's where the men wear the turbans. You know, and they actually, in, in the U.S., they're getting uh, targeted as being Osama bin Laden and stuff, and so they're doing a very big, um, I think, PR campaign right, uh, uh, campaign right now to tell people, hey, we are Indians, and this is our religion, and this is what we believe in, because it's actually a very pacifist religious in, in terms of its origins, uh, and very much against any form of hierarchy in terms of how you practice and who can be included in it. And you go to the Gurdwara there and see they have the free kitchen for anybody. And, uh, so, so that I wanted to bring that in as a part of India's diversity. And they are very far dominant in the north of India. And the state of Punjab has Sikh majority people. Uh, and of course the Mughal Empire was the biggest uh, Muslim empire in India. Of, uh, so at one point covered most of India. Um, and also to in some parts of the south. Um, and they were dominant for about 200 years, and though they didn't really die out for another 100 years, but they, they had, fought, had to fight the British, and that's how they declined a lot more. But what I want you to know is that there was a lot of cross fertilization of Hindu and Persian art, architecture, and literature, and it was fairly tolerant for the most part, and uh, except Aurangzeb was one of the most much more of a hardline orthodox Islamic leader, you know, uh, among the Mughals. And so the, the Mughals in North India fought the Sikhs, so the Sikhs became more militant. And then later the Sikhs got incorporated in large numbers into the British Indian Army, and so they became by British <coughs> became a martial race <laughs> to, to help that controls other parts of the world, I guess. You know. So I think, and the Mughal Empire, actually when you go to the Taj Mahal and also North Indian Delhi, you see a lot of Mughal architecture with a mixture of a lot of Hindu and Mughal thing. In the south, you'll see a lot more of the traditional Hindu architecture. In the north, is all mixed up. Yeah. All right. Here come the British, the Europe and the British. So Vasco da Gama, um, 
uh, beach cows <coughs> out. You won't go there, but it's in the Western, uh, port, port, then the Portuguese, Dutch, French, and finally the British, who emerged Darwin by the 1750s. Uh, but they actually, it was an East India Company at that time, and they officially, um, uh, the British became uh, uh, actually took official control of our rule over India in 1857 when uh, Queen Victoria was declared the Empress of India. So that was in 1857. Um, and of course that precipitated a lot of movements for cultural revival, nationalism, and also Hindu nationalism. Um, one thing that I want to uh, point out is this third bullet. Um, uh, where the British are the ones who brought the census and a lot of English language and they had to record everything. So as part of the recording, the people that they were only interacting with were the in Hindu elite, the Brahmins, and the local kings and queens so that they could you know, use them to rule India. So a lot of the information that they got about what India is like and how, what the Indian social system is like uh, they got from the Indian elites that they interacted with, not people out in the villages and communities where they actually lived. So they actually uh, developed in English uh, Orthodox Hindu and Muslim, Muslim texts as guides to Indian, those religions and Indian culture and gave more legitimacy and substance, oh, I got a typo there, to caste hierarchy and Sharia law that they interpreted as the strict Muslim law. So I think what I want to point out is that in reality, the way in which these things, uh, these uh, things were practiced in India were not as hardcore as the texts make it out to be. You know, so they said there was a fourfold caste system. Yes, there was, but how it was practiced, actually, people subverted it in many ways and challenged it in their daily lives. You know, and people actually protested against it. There's sort of like slave rebellion and form maroon communities, you know, uh, here in the US and the Caribbean and Brazil and other places, they did the same, you know, and they would move from one place to another and they would find land and suddenly they would say, oh, we are higher status, you know, our higher caste, they would do that. Uh, or they would um, um, uh, be given, they would, you know, fight and be rewarded uh, by land grants and then they would become dominant in that particular region, you know. So there was a lot of, and of course in terms of religion or, you know, people practiced in different ways. So rejected the caste system and practiced in, in other ways and uh, more of that. But anyway, uh, that's one important thing to keep in mind and then uh, because it affects how India is today. So Indians have a lot of modernity, but modern Indians are wearing saris and, be, and they are bank uh, CEOs of banks, like three or four of the biggest Indian banks have female CEOs, and those women will never be seen publicly wearing skirts. That's Western. They are wearing saris. They may wear <coughs> pet suits, but they wear saris. At their international executive meetings, so people say, oh, she's so traditional. No, she's very modern. And actually, saris have all these different modern designs, you know, just like uh, skirts and dresses have. So yeah, I really meant to say that make a distinction between modern and Western. And I think that's one way to understand it, you know? Because here again, even in the US, there are some people who are you know, very modern, but they may have some ideas that are, people might say are traditional ideas. It's the same way they do. So I think that's one way to kind of uh, look at it. Yeah, they, you, yeah, you will be overwhelmed, and it's OK. Be overwhelmed. Nothing's going to happen to you. You'll be in a safe space. Uh, yeah. As long as you don't wear by yourself. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. No, right. First time you're going to, don't, don't try to uh, be adventurous. You know, if you're talking, I mean, it's okay to talk, but you know, you never, some people will be really, really nice to you, and, uh, but then others might try to get a few bucks from you for doing something, you know, and cheat you. But that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, what is uh, the typical kind of school experience like in a way that's different from us and that probably mm -hmm. is divided into like rural versus urban? Yeah. Um, in, you know, like in America we start in kindergarten and mm -hmm. go to your grade school and then sometimes go to college or community college, but I don't know what the, the typical pattern is there and how that varies. Yeah. Um, but, uh, uh, 
overall, the education system is supposed to be free education to the age of 16, uh, you know, in India also. Um, but uh, a lot of people, uh, but it's uneven, the access even there. Yeah. Um, because the government schools, uh, which here are the state schools in, in India, they are very, uh, the funding is not very good. So they are often very poor uh, in terms of the facilities and technology, but that's accessible to everyone. They have those in the villages, but they may not have desks and chairs. So they'll be sitting under trees and but learning and doing what they need to do. They may have one teacher for 100 students sometimes, and so that's, or sometimes the teachers don't show up. You know, that's a big problem in the rural schools especially, but in the government schools, was either they just don't care or they're not paid or they go on leave and they don't have a substitute, so it's not as well organized, uh, unless somebody really pays attention to it. But then they have some central schools, um, um, which are uh, actually quite good and very well organized. They are government paid, but they have really invested in them for the last 30, 40 years, uh, a lot. And so they, can't, they turn out some of very good students, um, you know, and they also state schools, central schools, um, and you have, again, you know, starting from kindergarten and going through elementary, uh, and like the, the main thing is going through to 10th grade, 8th and then 10th grade, mm -hmm. and then they have 10, then they have plus 2, which would be the 11th and the 12th grades, which is a sort of a transition to college. Mm -hmm. So at the end of 10th grade, you do a board exam, which is a national exam. Mm -hmm. Everybody does it. Um, so uh, if you're from a better school, you're more likely to pass that. Uh, so a lot of people in rural areas, for example, or lower income people, or lower caste people, if they don't have access to all the good teaching and education, they may not pass it. You know, so they may try it several times before they pass their 10th grade. But once you pass 10th, everyone does all the subjects. In the 11th and 12th, you select your tracks. Um, and you select the science track, the, uh, um, the social studies track, the uh, uh, accounting, I guess, a business study, or whatever, or, you know, uh, the commerce, commerce track, that's what they call it, this year, commerce track. So then what happens is that when you go to college after 12th, uh, once you pass that 12th grade board exams, I think national exams, that's when you can apply to go to college. And depending on how you score in those, you, you can get into the better or the worse colleges. So in terms of the college system now, there's, uh, I think you'll find there's just such a variety and very uneven in terms of quality. Mm -hmm. And so there's the older government state colleges and universities which still have the best reputation. And, but there's a, there's a lot of newer ones, private ones, uh, which had a shaky start, but some of them are really good and some of them have become really, really good. <laughs> and some are pretty poor quality, so. So the 11th and 12th grade, um, do families have to pay for that typically, or do students just have to pass that? Uh, I think, um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, but I think if they have to pay, it's a very small amount. Oh, actually, now that I think about it, you pay if you're in a private school, but I think if you go to a government school, it's a very, very low fee. Yeah, yeah, very low fee if it's in a government school, but if you have a private one, you pay just like here, private schools. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I think you pay very little. I went in the 70s, 60s, so I don't remember. <laughs> it's changed since then. In fact, my school leaving, I did 11th grade, 11th grade, and then it was called, it was still the British system. Mm -hmm. um, that time, India had not yet fully transitioned into its own educational system. So my uh, school leaving certificate is from the University of Cambridge. <coughs> it's Cambridge, I, 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 it was called Senior Cambridge, which in Britain is called the old levels, I think, yeah. So that's what I did. So it's changed a lot now yeah. since then. So it's not 12. Yes. Yeah. I was drawing some parallels when you were talking about sort of the rise of uh, a nationalist sort of movement of kind of what we're seeing here. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it made me you know, sort of start thinking about this. And I'm not, I'm using the word judgment, but I don't, I don't think it's that harsh. I don't, I don't think. But how would, you know, uh, what's the overall view of uh, you know, Americans, I guess, coming in. Is, are there areas that, you know, that are liberal and then areas that are... Uh, you mean parts of the country? 
in parts of the country, maybe parts of the city. Yeah, it's hard to say, you know, because I think more you see um, uh, the wealthier parts and the less wealthy parts of cities. Mm -hmm. But among the wealthy people, some people are liberal and some are conservative. Right. You know, right. so. Among, and same among the poor or the middle class, you know. So it's really hard to say that some areas, like in India, I, in terms of political parties, there's no real liberal or uh, conservative party, but I think the Indian National Congress, the Congress party, which actually uh, was the party that took India to independence, and then it ruled pretty much since the, till the late 1980s, was Jawaharlal Nehru and then his daughter Indira Gandhi and then the other guy who, both of them actually, she only died in 1981. So from 1947 to 1981, except for two years in between, she and her dad were the ones who were India's prime ministers for that first 30, 40 years of India's, 35 some years of India's independence. So, and then after that, also for the next 10 years, it was the Congress. But the reason I mention them is that they still present themselves as the most liberal political party. So I guess the areas where they would then have support, uh, they would be more liberal people. But liberal by their, liberal there means uh, people, they, they pretend to be more inclusive of people of different religions in their political system. <laughs> right. Well, they, because because there's there's all uh, because there's a lot of uh, you know um, uh, like it, it's debated, right? Because uh, they'll say, oh, you're just trying to appease the Muslims so that you can get elected. But when you get elected, Muslims in India actually are still among the poor, uh, disproportionately among the poor and the disadvantaged. You know. So, and in, uh, Muslims in India are actually not the radical Islamic thing, people that you hear about. Uh, a lot of that is sort of coming from outside, you know, um, uh, especially some groups in Pakistan, and that's a big problem in India. Of course, Pakistan disputes that, that they're not a problem, Indians are the problem. But, uh, but <laughs> yeah, um, but I think the Congress party, but it's now not really doing very well. Every, in most parts of India because it became more of a family dynasty. You know, oh yeah, then Indira Gandhi's son became the prime minister, Rajiv Gandhi, and he was assassinated. Then his wife, who's Italian by the way, is now the leader of the Congress party, but she, they won the election about 10 years ago, but she, because she was Italian, she could not, I mean, the Indian law allows her, but everyone is, Hindu said, no, 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 she's Italian, she's a foreigner, she can't be the prime minister, but she had the most votes for party, right? So she's still the leader of the party, but they really um, made somebody else the prime minister at that time, because it's a parliamentary system. And now they're not, uh, she's trying to groom her son and her daughter, but, uh, but there's no independent, you know, leaders coming out from that party. So now you have so many political parties in India, but the BJP, the Bharatiya Janata Party, which is the more of the Hindu party, is more. And then there's a lot of regional parties. Some of them may be more liberal. But I think you can't say any part of the country is more liberal than the other part. I don't think you can actually generalize in that respect. Yeah, I think it's, does that sort of answer you? <laughs> it does, yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking of the story. Saying, like, what's the overall view of Americans? What, what oh, that expect? I didn't answer that. Overall view of America, um, I think it will vary um, uh, depending on who you talk to, and some may be more honest than others uh, <laughs> because when they talk to you, they won't always want to say. But I think um, it was kind of interesting. Uh, there was one right-wing Hindu group in Mumbai that prayed for Trump to win the elections, and it was all over the newspapers, and they had an idol of him, they were worshiping it, and, you know, so they turned him into a religious icon, <laughs> this one group, you know. Uh, and so they were happy that he won, and uh, the Indian government has been kind of wary because uh, they, they really want the H-1B visa to stay, uh, because Indian companies benefit from that, and Indian software engineers benefit from that, but Trump is cutting back on that, so they don't like that. So, um, uh, people who are more, I guess the people who are liberal in India, uh, liberal sort of uh, 
uh, more um, sort of socially conscious people, they are very critical of um, American policies and domination. Uh, but India want, uh, America wants to really invest in India a lot. So this, I think those terms are pretty good. You know, um, Most people will be friendly with the Americans. They may not like their policies, but they'll like being friends with Indians and they like to come and study in the U.S. You know, but they're getting some of them are getting weary because there have been some attacks on Indians after Trump got elected. I mean, they've been there earlier too, but I think some of them became very high profile. And so, after this engineer was it an engineer who was killed in Kansas? Um, a lot of parents in don't send your kids to the U.S. to study. Don't send your kids to the U.S. to study. You know. So it's not that they don't like America or Americans, but they may be wary of some of the things that are happening here. So I think that's, uh, there's no general, again, there's no general view of America, you know. Um, it just depends on, if you get to know Indians, they're like, you know, they're good friends. I mean, you get to know good friends. <laughs> Do most people speak English? No. Um, uh, actually, in the cities, you might find a lot of people speaking some English, or they may have learned some English in schools, but may not be as uh, conversant. So you find a lot of uh, 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 ads uh, for uh, English lessons and stuff because people want to be able to learn English. Mm -hmm. uh, because in schools, the instruction may not be as good, so they are not very used to speaking. Uh, they say that about a third of Indians might know some English, but I'm not sure how many of them are actually very proficient mm -hmm. in it. Um, but India, because India was ruled by the British for such a long time, uh, uh, a lot of Indians, especially in the urban areas, they know English. Mm -hmm. Just depends on which school you go to, and they would. But they also is what's known as English. So you see a lot of mixture of Hindi and English. Hindi, English, Punjabi, my language is also Punjabi, so I, when I speak with my brothers, so everybody is as fluent as I am in English, at, because we went to English medium convent schools. My dad was in the army, so that was very much of a British influence on him. Uh, so we went to those, um, uh, with nuns taught us all the way through, because <laughs> it was considered good schools for girls to go to with nuns, you know. Uh, so yeah, they taught us very good English, but um, uh, so we were fine. But still, when we talk among each other, among ourselves, we we also were fluent in speaking Hindi because our other people we interacted with spoke Hindi or some other language, and on Punjabi. So we spoke three languages growing up. So now when we talk to one another, it drives my husband crazy because he can't understand what he's saying. It was in the middle of an English sentence, we'll throw in Hindi and Punjabi words and phrases, you know. So a lot of people would be doing that. So you can ask directions and they'll all try to give you directions in English. Sometimes you may understand what they're saying sometimes, no. Sometimes you may get, go to the wrong place. Right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. But can we talk a little bit about gender? Gender, yeah. I actually took out that slide. Gender. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> because that's why I, I actually did a lot of research. I, mean, I figured there won't be so much time. To, but yeah, um, I'm going to go back to my notes here because I think I can give you, I don't want to say too much because we only got a couple of minutes left, but I did have it in my notes. Ah, right here. Um, Okay, what I was going to say, and I'll say this, very much a patriarchal system in India. Um, so the status of women overall is lower, historically. Um, but there are powerful goddesses that symbolize female power and strength. You know, so that's sort of what's come down even now. So while at, at, on the one hand, you know, women are supposed to be submissive and uh, do the housework, and they still do the majority of the housework, uh, there have been very powerful women also who uh, have sort of challenged those. So I, I was talking about the Pakta poets, many of them were women, and they basically to get more power themselves, they basically left their husbands and their children and just went off and um, took, um, uh, what do you call, uh, 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 became ascetics, you know, uh, uh, to get out. Some of them did that. And so then there's also very powerful goddesses in the Hindu pantheon. You know, there's all kinds of discussion of them. 
Um, and so in the dominant Hindu ideology, because that's a dominant ideology, uh, in, uh, you know, the female represents both Shakti, which is energy and power, as well as Prakriti, which is nature. You know, so she's a powerful figure. Um, but then, because she's so powerful, they are seen as dangerous, and so they need to be controlled. You know, so that's sometimes that's a myth that's come down in many places. Um, and the male, or which is Purusa, is a cosmic male considered appropriate. So this is in the Brahmanic texts have set this idea. Um, and then uh, the caste system then became much more of a vehicle to control women in order to improve and maintain caste status and honor. So I think the, the restrictions of women were much more in the upper elite sections than in the lower, because a lot of women in the middle and lower classes, in the villages especially since it's still a rural economy, had to do a lot of actual work to maintain their family, you know, agricultural work, uh, milking cows to sell milk. So they were able to actually uh, attain higher status because of their economic power, you know, so they, uh, and, and, uh, and also challenge some of these rules. So in the modern um, world, I think the British kind of said, oh, the status of women is so bad, we should do something. But then some of the uh, Indian nationalist leaders decided that instead of the British telling us what to do, they actually took on their own and say we need to be self-critical, we need to educate our women and girls also. So they actually had a lot of uh, education for the elite women and they wanted the others to also learn. So uh, now more and more I think women are getting educated. Um, uh, so um, there's a real active women's movement in India. So, uh, so it's still slow um, and there's still problems, you know, as anywhere else. And in some sense, uh, cases, it's because of um, the problem is to do with technology, actually, because there's a, still a preference for males, and so they abort female fetuses. That's a big problem. Uh, but there's movements against it, too. And I've done some work with women in grassroots organizations. And so the one issue with political power is that in city and county and village elections, um, I think 33 percent or 40 percent now of all elected officials have to be women. There's a reservation of seats for women, so that's really bringing about some change. Some of them are, you know, people that the male say, say "Oh, my wife can," you know, one powerful figure would say, "Oh, my wife can stand for election, and I'll be the power behind the throne," kind of thing. That happens, but more and more, those women are actually taking on a lot of very good causes for women's and girls' education big movement now to get toilets so people can actually go and have, because girls have a real problem. I mean, India has a real shortage of toilets, um, you know, and you might see that if you want.